I'm Vera Wilt, Riverside Township Supervisor. The program you are about to see is a presentation of Riverside Township and the Riverside Township Mental Health Board. The Township provides social services to most of the village of Riverside, about half of North Riverside, the Hollywood section of Brookfield, unincorporated Riverside Lawn, and a small part of Lyons. Among the free health and welfare services available to any township resident are a food pantry, a nurse's closet with durable medical goods, and televised exercise classes. Most importantly, the Mental Health Board provides a community referral center for a myriad of services. Many of our other programs are on hold during the pandemic, but today the Mental Health Board has prepared a program that is very timely and essential during this highly stressful and unusual year. In partnership with several area agencies, the Mental Health Board funds referral services, counseling, and support to the residents of the township. The isolation, fear, stress, and anxiety brought on or exacerbated by COVID-19 has made the coming holidays an even more precarious time. Today, we present a discussion on suicide prevention, coping with depression, and anxiety. The Mental Health Board's consultant, Dr. Joseph Troiani, will introduce the representatives of some of the agencies which serve our community, and he will lead a discussion addressing the specific needs of different age groups and give all of us some insight into recognizing a problem and how to get help for yourselves and your loved ones. Our thanks to the Village of Riverside for understanding the pressing nature of this issue and allowing Riverside TV to safely produce this program while we are in a period of limitations on gatherings. Thank you very much. Welcome to our third presentation in the last 12 months by the Riverside Township Community Mental Health Board. And this evening, we're gonna be focusing on the topic of preventing suicide and coping with depression and anxiety. As I mentioned, this is our third program. About a year ago, we presented a program examining mental health considerations and issues regarding recreational marijuana. And again, looking at the newfound research on um, the impact of recreational marijuana on youth, adolescents, as well as young adults. That was followed by a second program that was done earlier this year in coping with stress through the life cycle, looking at uh, mental health issues, substance abuse, substance use issues uh, during adolescence, teens, uh, young adult, adulthood, as well as with uh, senior citizens or the elderly. Today's program, as I mentioned, is examining suicide during a period of time when we're dealing with COVID-19. I have a panel of experts, all members of community agencies that serve uh, the Riverside Township area. And let me go ahead and start uh, by introducing them. Our first uh, person is Anna Padron Sikora. And Anna is the Vice President of Community Engagement with Pillars Community Health. Welcome, Anna. Then we have Anita Panor, who's the Executive Director of Way Back In, which is a comprehensive substance use uh, treatment facility, uh, including working with problem gambling. Next to Anita is Chris Ward. Chris Ward is the Grant and Outreach Coordinator uh, for Way Back In. And then finally, we have Caitlin Joy Smith, who's the Director of Development for the National Alliance on mental illness, Metro Suburban. And I, I welcome our, our guest speakers today. 
um, to deal, to talk about a topic that uh, hits close to home uh, for everyone. When we talk about suicide, um, we're talking about a problem that continues to be a growing problem in the United States. The first landmark uh, study was done in 2009 of all suicides in the United States and subsequently there have been repeated studies giving some of the true numbers regarding the incident rate of suicides. It's especially an important topic if we were just dealing with the up and coming holidays. There are two periods of time where suicides will increase. It's during the holidays and of course it's during the uh, um, uh, early spring or the end of winter. We have the additional complication, of course, of COVID-19. Uh, with COVID-19, well, we're going into uh, the mid part of the second wave. Uh, the second wave, as you are hearing on the news, uh, it's infecting more people, putting more people in the hospitals. Our hospitals are very rapidly creeping towards capacity. And of course, the sadness of the fatality rate from those who are experiencing COVID-19. At the same time, we're hearing some optimistic news regarding uh, the vaccine. And we're already hearing about shipments of the vaccine uh, starting to move into the geographical location, i.e. Chicago, Cook County, as well as the Collar Counties. But there's an old saying that it is darkest before dawn. And for the next four to six weeks, we're gonna be going through an even more difficult period with increasing hospitalizations, increasing fatalities, increasing positive uh, cases um, before the vaccine uh, is widely distributed, which hopefully will be uh, towards the end of the month. Again, this is all during a very difficult time um, called the holiday season, when depression will tend to be more extensive. And that's why, uh, with the help of the Riverside Township Board, with the help of Riverside Television, we're putting together the special cable TV program to address some of these considerations and educate you as some of the things that you might expect to see, as well as resources available and what we could do to better cope with the period of uh, the holidays and um, being uh, with the th second wave of COVID-19. What I'd like to do is uh, have a discussion of suicide in general, and I'm gonna ask Anna um, the following question. Why is it, generally speaking, why is it so difficult to talk about suicide? Well, I think that um, there's still a lot of stigma around um, mental health and specifically around suicide. And so when um, somebody is having suicidal thoughts or um, there's been a death by suicide, that it's really difficult for people to talk about it. And so um, part of having these kind of conversations is really to hopefully um, empower, encourage uh, you to to think about uh, your loved ones and the people in your lives, to have honest conversations um, if somebody is, is feeling extremely isolated or depressed or very anxious during this time. Um, as Joe mentioned, um, with the holidays and the layer of COVID, this is um, kind of a, a deeper dive um, into mental health this year than in other years. And so we want to think about our words and our language. Um, so we we um, know that words matter. And so thinking about um, a situation or a loved one who has uh, died by suicide, we don't say uh, committed suicide or was successful um, completing a suicide. Um, we want to um, respect that that person um, died by suicide and be thoughtful to their family. Um, we also want to think about um, the ripple effect, right? When somebody um, is uh, dies by suicide and the family is grieving, that those um, 
that it, it reaches many, many more people than we know. So um, we want to talk about it and put it out there so that we can prevent um, suicide as much as possible. And I have a, a second question um, regarding what are some of the myths about suicide. And one that comes to mind is uh, the myth that if you talk to somebody about suicide, mm -hmm. you're going to make them feel more suicidal mm -hmm. or talking about it might cause them to kill themselves. Yeah, and that's something that um, is a very widespread myth that we like to, um, that the fact is that um, that person, if that person is having suicidal thoughts um, and is, is struggling, they're already thinking about it. And what we know uh, as mental health professional is that most of the time people just want somebody to ask them to talk about it. And so to be as direct as possible, if you are worried about somebody, to ask them if they are having suicidal thoughts um, and I encourage you that even if you may not understand how they're feeling that you are a listening uh, person to them that then you could help um, navigate how to get professionals and more resources to that person. Okay. Somebody watching this program might have the question of well if I think a, a loved one is feeling suicidal how could somebody talk about this? How, how does mm -hmm. uh a non-professional, a non-psychiatrist, mm -hmm. psychologist, social worker, mm -hmm. or counselor talk about mm -hmm. this? Yes, and really it's it's about um, saying, I'm worried about you, I care about you, you are not alone, let's figure this out together. And especially, again, as um, we know that um, anxiety and depression are very high right now, if, if uh, we were vulnerable um, with our mental health before the pandemic, that certainly the pandemic has made us more vulnerable. And so we want to be able to uh, to sit with them and talk with them so that we can connect to resources. And that's what we're gonna um, do today. We're gonna share some really good resources we have on a national level, on a local level, and then right here in Riverside. Good. You know, if um, COVID-19 would not be happening, mm -hmm. we would still have this presentation today. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the holidays mm -hmm. that makes people feel depressed, anxious, mm -hmm. or even suicidal? Yep. A time that most people think is a very happy time of year. Yeah. Well, we know that um, that the holidays and are, are, can be complicated, and um, that for again, without um, the the layer of COVID, that it could be a very uh, lonely time. And this year, in particular, we. Um, are having to be extra safe. And so when we think about um, not coming together in large groups and you know, kind of checking in with folks that we normally um, get together with, we wanna make sure that we're very thoughtful of um, any kind of uh, grief and death that have happened throughout uh, related to COVID-19 or just in, in um, kind of natural life. Because again, those are um, things that get triggered more at this time. We miss the loved ones more during the holidays. And so how do we um, acknowledge that we have this loss when we are dealing with um, loss every day right now um, loss of routines, loss of relationships, loss of our jobs, or loss of our um, just kind of our kind of regular traditions. And so, how do we really check in and think about um, the holidays in the the most safest way possible? Yeah, I was just reading uh, the Chicago newspaper, the Sunday newspaper, and I couldn't believe the number of pages devoted to people dying. Mm -hmm. And it's in that risk group for COVID-19, mm -hmm. and uh, that that was kind of a hit in the gut mm -hmm. to go ahead and see that, including some of the um, uh, memorials talking about uh, they were experiencing COVID-19, and that was one of the contributions. But you know, how does somebody reach out? Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about it earlier, but mm -hmm. how does somebody reach out if they're, they're seeing it with their parents mm -hmm. or they're seeing it with a brother or sister. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and again, I, I encourage you to use uh, direct language and to say, you know, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Are you afraid that you can't be safe? Because again, we, we tend to shy away and we could be very passive and we want to be very clear to that person that we're worried about them. And so, you know, we, 
oftentimes if we're worried about somebody's safety, we, could, we have to call 911 or we can certainly go to a nearest emergency room. Um, but if that person is saying that they um, can be safe, but they are looking for help, then this is where we could talk about the resources that we have uh, locally and how do we get them to the, to the right supports. As you talked about a little earlier, there's a role that depression, anxiety, and substance use has in suicide. Caitlin, looking at depression and anxiety, how does stress and anxiety, which we all experience, um, become a concern? What's the difference between I'm, I'm normally anxious or I'm depressed about some of the stuff that's going on, and, and when does it get to that boiling point? Absolutely. Um, we all experience, um, from children to adults alike, some form of stress or anxiety in our lifetime. Uh, we all know the butterflies in our stomachs, the, um, the, the, the lump in our throat as we uh, prep for a big interview or perhaps a, a big test. Um, uh, the, the difference between a level of stress or anxiety um, like that, and more of a serious um, anxious exper or experience of anxiety, is that those, it doesn't pass with a moment or perhaps in a few hours or a day. It, it, it floods us. And it allows us, it, it, it gets in the way of our everyday functioning. So um, we might have an overwhelming sense of fear throughout the day. We might not be able to sleep throughout the night. We might uh, have difficulty concentrating or um, having uh, feelings of restlessness or irritability. Anxiety can also really manifest itself physically as well. So we might have a tightness in our chest or uh, our muscles and body will feel sore. Um, it affects our sleep, our appetite, and we, our heart can literally um, beat more rapidly under such duress. The important thing to know about all of these symptoms related to anxiety is that just as someone who has diabetes, just, some, just as someone who has asthma um, gets the treatment they need, so do those and so is it available for those experiencing anxiety. So with the help of counseling, with the help of the resources that we will speak to, with the help of medication when necessary, it does lift and it can lift and treatment is always possible. Hmm. My next question is, you know, what's the difference between feeling sad versus experiencing depression? Uh, as a mental health condition. What's normal sadness? When does it become problematic? When is it something of concern? Like anxiety, which is a human experience, so is sadness. Um, and as you pointed to, there is a lot of sadness right now. And it's a very normal human reaction to grief, to loss, um, to other problems or difficulties that we might be facing. Ultimately, though, it doesn't take over our life. Sadness comes and it goes. Uh, but uh, sadness in the form of depression uh, can feel like it's taking over your world. Um, interestingly, someone experiencing depression might not even feel sad at all. They might feel an emptiness or they might feel um, a void of feelings. And that, among other signs and symptoms of depression, can mount to where it starts to affect your daily life and gets in the way of normal functioning. Um, so you might have a persistent, sad, anxious, empty mood, one filled with gloom, um, feelings of guilt or, or worthlessness or helplessness. And you, you, one may lose interest or joy in things that they once found to be uh, pleasurable. Again, like anxiety, it can manifest itself physically. One can have a 
uh, a really difficult time falling asleep or staying asleep or sleeping excessively. It can also affect our appetite. Um, in, it can take form in different uh, ways in different people too. So um, there is um, some um, research that reveals that um, men typically display depression in some more gendered forms than women and uh, vice versa. But it, the most important thing um, when, when recognizing this in, in yourself or in, an, in another is again that with the right tools and resources and support, recovery is possible. Let's talk a little bit about substance use. And of course, when we talk about substance use, we're talking about alcohol. Uh, we're talking about recreational marijuana. Uh, we're talking about illicit drugs. We're talking about prescribed drugs, um, as well as over-the-counter drugs. And it's often said that there's a close relationship between suicide and substance use. Chris, can you explain a little bit about the relationship between substance use and suicide? Absolutely, Joe. So suicide is a leading cause of death among people who misuse alcohol and drugs. One of the main reasons for this is the intoxication that occurs. While intoxicated or under the influence of substances, our decision-making is significantly impaired. Our inhibitions decrease and feelings of hopelessness, fear, burdensomeness, and depressive moods can increase. With our inhibitions lowered and our decision-making impaired, we are more likely to act on impulses. Impulsivity and suicidality are strongly connected. In a study conducted by the CDC in 2014, approximately 22% of suicide deaths involved alcohol intoxication, mm. with a blood alcohol content at or above the legal limit. Furthermore, opiates were present in 20% of suicide deaths. Opioids, which are extremely lethal, with fentanyl being readily available in the streets, are responsible for an alarming amount of overdose deaths. Yeah. Overdoses can be accidental or intentional, but nevertheless mean that someone has taken their own life. Hmm. How are persons suffering from substance use and gambling use affected? So people who are suffering from substance and gambling use are at an elevated risk for suicide, particularly if they have a co-occurring mental condition. People who are isolated and stressed, as much of the population is during a pandemic, frequently turn to substances to alleviate their negative feelings. Those in recovery are facing stresses and heightened urges to use substances in gambling and are at a greatly increased risk for relapse. And because substance use so greatly increases the risk of suicide, one of the most important steps in suicide prevention is recovery from any addiction. Peers, Family members and addiction treatment providers should be alert to this increased risk for relapse. Clinicians and family members of a loved one who is struggling should monitor for signs of substance misuse, given the unprecedented stressors, fears, or even grief they may be facing. Okay. Of course, we're going through a very unique period of time. How are you seeing COVID-19, the pandemic that we're going through, affecting both substance as well as gambling use? So one of the main things is that alcohol dispensaries have been deemed an essential business during the pandemic, and we've seen that alcohol sales have gone up nearly 54% as a result of the pandemic. Online orders for alcohol have gone up nearly 500%. This increased availability of substances of abuse is a public health crisis. You can now order alcohol to be delivered to your door. With financial stress, job loss, feelings of isolation, boredom, simply just having more time at home alcohol use and abuse has risen tremendously. There's data to show that people are even drinking more than usual during the pandemic to cope with the stress. Even things like social media has promoted increased alcohol consumption with COVID day drinking, quarantinis, and virtual happy hours. Alcohol use to cope with stress associated with the pandemic has now become a communal, culturally motivated way to deal with these intense, possibly newfound emotional distress and uncertainty during this unprecedented time. Lastly, people who are dealing with increased gambling issues and gambling use disorders. When all the casinos closed during the pandemic, online gambling, gaming, and lottery ticket purchases increased. When the casinos began reopening, it became very risky for those who are coping with the stress and financial uncertainty brought on by the pandemic. Due to the lockdown and lack of sporting events, people struggling with gambling use had turned to gambling types with potentially even higher addictive potential. 
We've got some time, and what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about the warning signs and indicators of suicide. And uh, I'd like to invite Anita uh, to make comments, as well as Chris. What are the warning signs? What are the indicators of suicide that, that one would watch for or might pick up on? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you know, it's a never any one thing, right? Um, there's really kind of a number of things that we can look at and see what can be happening. Um, I always caution people that you know your loved one, your neighbors, your friends the best. If you feel like something is off, something might be off. Um, you know, people who commit suicide or people who attempt suicide and then are kind of asked afterwards, um, mental health plays a role in about 50% of those, but it's never any one kind of thing and often it's undiagnosed mental health. So a lot of times the person themselves or their loved ones will not even know that there might be any kind of mental health. Often, like uh, Caitlin talked about, somebody might be struggling with anxiety, depression, and they might not even know what that kind of a name is. They might not even know that there is help available. But other things that we do kind of know that play a role is job satisfaction and job security. Well, during these times, during COVID times, we are all very, very stressed over job security as well as um, satisfaction. Even those of us who still have work and are working often can be very, very stressed by the high levels of um, what we're doing. Is it safe? Can I go to work? If I go to work, is my family safe because of the COVID um, and anything um, that I might be facing. Uh, for mental health professionals, it has been a very high risk time. For our first responders, it has been such a high risk time and we have seen suicide increase in first responders because of what they're seeing due to COVID. And I was going to mention in, the, in our community, in our area, there have been some high profile suicides of uh, a law enforcement professional mm -hmm. and also uh, a person with uh, the fire department. Um, in, a local, in the area nearby. And those are just two high profile uh, suicides of first responders just in the last uh, couple of months. So if you think of the first responders and what they're seeing, your ER doctors, your ER nurses who are working long hours, who are working overtime, it is really important to reach out and check in with those people. Um, in addition, when you're talking about first responders or doctors and nurses, um, it is um, access. Do they have access and means to weapons, to medications, um, and, and do other people, you know, it might be a retired police officer who still mm -hmm. has his own weapon. It might be your elder elderly um, neighbor who has a variant of medications in their house. So it is really important to really kind of make sure that we're watching out for that. It is a history of abuse and trauma and having witnessed abuse or trauma. It is isolation and what are we seeing during COVID? We are seeing isolation. So it is definitely necessary that we're checking in and kind of following up with everybody. Um, bullying and harassment, which were high really during, um, you know, kind of general times. And now that everybody's spending so much more time on social media um, and um, in technology, especially kids and the, um, the youth, it is really important important to monitor and see what's happening. Previous suicide attempts and a family history of suicide. Um, if you know that somebody has had previous suicide attempts or a family history of them, it is important to check in and kind of see what's happening. And then obviously um, incarceration, so anyone looking at possibly being incarcerated or any kind of criminal activity and criminal, um, you know, kind of, um, law enforcement, it is good to check with that. Um, and then kind of the lack of access to mental health or substance use services. So with those of us who don't know or just really can't get to any or just the assumption that nothing is available for you can often be very triggering and can be very potential. So those are really important. Good. Thank you, Anita. Again, you, you shared with us some of the warning signs uh, that someone who is suicidal might experience. And you talked extensively of what is increasing the rate of suicides. Uh, Chris, so if you notice that someone, uh, that a loved one, is acting um, differently, how can you approach that individual? So if you think a loved friend or a loved one is considering suicide, it's best to approach the subject with them openly and honestly, kind of like Anna was talking about toward the beginning of the segment. Um, making sure to be non-judgmental and non-confrontational. 
And I think it's really important to stress again the importance that it's okay to be direct and to ask them, are you suicidal? Are you feeling this way? Can you express to me how you are feeling? And then you can help them by finding a professional help for them. Um, it's best not to try to minimize any of the problems that they express or that they're going through, or to try to change their mind through shaming them. Um, just to share a personal experience, I actually um, am, a am a recovering alcoholic and I suffered from substance use disorder and also suffered from suicidal ideation and I even went as far as to looking up ways to end my own life. And I just wanna say that one of the most important things you can do is to reach out to someone. If you're feeling that way, even if it feels like it's the hardest thing to do, reach out and just let someone know that you're feeling that way and they can get you the help that you need. So if anyone's watching this, reach out to someone you love. You can make it through it and recovery is possible. Okay. Anita, what if somebody that one knows um, has made a decision to end their life by suicide? Well, some of the things that we see and some of the things that we know um, is, um, you know, often people will kind of go through mood swings. So they will kind of uh, have despair on one end and then be really calm the next day. Um, we also want to caution that if you do check in with someone and, you know, they might seem really upset one day but seem okay the next day, that you don't just kind of give up and be like, well, checked in with them once, they seem okay, right? You want to continue checking in because they might seem really calm. And like you've mentioned, kind of that calm before the storm. Um, often um, that, those last moments you feel at peace and you feel comfortable with your decision. And so it is important that when you know somebody's suffering, you continue checking in with them. Um, when you notice um, somebody saying goodbye to their friends and their family and kind of really making a big deal about, you know, like, well, this is a difficult year, this is a difficult Christmas, these are difficult holidays, um, you know, we won't ever see each other again, and really making a big deal about saying goodbye giving away their possessions or kind of really kind of making means, you know, selling houses, giving um, their car away, uh, kind of really settling all their debt and settling kind of their scores. It's really important to make sure that you're um, checking in with someone. And if they're uh, planning or they ask or you know that they're planning on buying anything that seems like a means to end their life, if it's a gun, if it's medication, um, if they're buying things that they really shouldn't, you know, that you don't suspect that rope, other tools, um, ways of taking care of themselves, checking in into their insurance policies, checking in into, mm. um, you know, kind of what will happen or, you know, asking questions of family, like where, where is grandma buried and would I be buried next to her? Um, th those are kind of important questions then and kind of reaching out. And if you do at any point, like Chris mentioned, um, if any, if you do feel, reach out, ask questions, and know that there is help available. There's national and local helplines. Always call 911 if you feel unsafe. Um, and if somebody just needs more information, they can always text, talk to 741741, which is a local um, a site, um, just, just to kind of communicate with a counselor, you sometimes will have residual issues when you know somebody's dealing with ending their life, so it's important, just as important for you to maybe talk to somebody as it is for that person. Don't leave them alone. If you know somebody is um, at risk, don't just abandon, check in, um, make sure that you stay with them if it's deemed appropriate, a and always make sure that you dial 911. If you feel like someone is in danger, there's no shame, there's nothing wrong with having a uh, wellness check done. Um, that is what our first responders are here for, that is what this community is here for. Um, it is always better to act and make sure that somebody is safe than to kind of think back and say, I could have done more. Yeah. You know, I was going to mention, uh, I live about a half a block from the railroad tracks and uh, I know in the morning, if we hear helicopters hovering uh, over the tracks, our first thought, and often it's right, that uh, somebody stepped in front of the train as a way of killing themselves. And that's happened to the towns, the villages, and the cities all up and down uh, the tracks. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, it's become known as uh, death by metro. And I've noticed at our train station, 
and I'm glad to see it. I see there are signs uh, regarding getting help if you feel suicidal, um, a phone number to call. And, and as we're gonna talk more about what are some of the resources for those who might be listening to this program uh, and they're having those thoughts and what can they do immediately uh, in terms of picking up the phone. Well, we talked about substance abuse. We looked at anxiety and depression and, of course, the warning signs. I'd like to take a few minutes and ask Anna to talk with us about suicide in children. So if we think about um, children and families as well as, like, the elderly, you know, we there's very um, specific... Um, points to to consider as um, again we're thinking about um, how stress is impacting our, the different categories of our of our population and so when we think about um, children which is really looking at more of um, of children and adolescent that um, their whole world has changed for the school year and that most, um, if not all, the children are learning remotely, right? And so the impact of um, being disconnected from their schools and from their friends has, um, you know, dramatically changed their socialization. And so um, as, as much as we know that we're... Um, we and the, the schools are doing um, the best they can for kids to be connected during school time, but that um, those relationships that kind of happen naturally at school with like the school social workers or with the teachers, with the school staff um, are not happening right now. And so I, you know, really do encourage um, parents to be in communications with the schools and the teachers because um, you may be seeing things at home as um, children's behavior is changing. Um, and again, it's hard to sometimes tease out if that um, some of the depressive feelings or isolation is due to um, specific mood swings or is it due to um, some deeper some kind of um, deeper processes. And so, um, like my other colleagues have said, that it really is a time to look at how the mood is affecting um, their ability to function. And um, because our days look different and our routines are different, again, um, the, that, that, that may not be as clear. Um, the one thing that I, you know, want to say, and this is not specific uh, to children and adolescents, but um, with uh, the COVID-19 um, shift, most, if not all, of our resources have moved to telehealth. And so what that means is that, again, reaching out for help and connecting virtually has um, become much easier than it ever has before before, um, especially um, to consult or to um, ask about crisis resources. Um, so I just I want to make sure that um, as we think about you know, how to support parents, um, how to support parent communities on, um, you know, is, is that we're all kind of struggling in different ways and that um, is there times where we should be reaching out for additional help and when are those times? Um, you know, as again, it was mentioned that if there's been um, a, a, suicide, a death by suicide of a loved one or a family member or history, that that also um, does increase risk. And so we always want to be paying attention to that. If, if um, your adolescent or your loved one is impacted, that those number, that that's also something to um, to pay attention to. And that all of these topics are very complex. So like Anita said, it's not just one thing ever, but that it's a layer of, of multiple, um, and most of it has to do with thinking, right? For, with thoughts that um, may not be logical to everybody else, but things about uh, feeling like they are a burden to us or feeling like the world would be better off without them. That these are real, real thoughts and that it's not necessarily um, that we're our job to try to convince them that they're not, but to, again, be able to be a present listener so that they um, can get to those conclusions, right? And so I don't know if um, that helps with answering some of about the children and adolescents. Yeah. I was going to ask, uh, 
the, especially the high school kids, mm -hmm. uh, juniors and seniors, mm -hmm. no homecoming, yeah. um, no sports, mm -hmm. uh, no prom. Yep. Um, it almost as if there's a loss mm -hmm. uh, of what is to be uh, uh, among the best times of my youth. Yep. And how do you see that playing out? Yeah, it's a like a collective loss, right? And so, or collective grief. And so I think that the more that we um, think about uh, creating new opportunities or new uh, traditions during these times, um, again, this is where um, the, the support of other parents or the support of your uh, community on, um, around children really matters on like what are some things that is working for your family? What are some other ways that um, we're um, acknowledging some of these milestones even if we can't do it in the traditional way? And so pay, paying attention to again, what are some of those needs that, um, your, that your child um, needs or your students need at this time? Mm -hmm. um, because again, they're not going Going to school, so um, the the assessment process really happens is happening at home. You know, what's often not talked about is mm -hmm. uh, suicide among senior citizens mm -hmm. or the elderly. Yeah. And you know, uh, I have friends of mine who can't see their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't see their adult children. Yep. Um, they're even more isolated. Uh, they can't uh, meet up or go out with their friends. Yeah. Uh, they can't participate in activities that they would normally participate in, yep. would participate. I, yeah. One of the things I, I, I heard a few weeks ago is, God, when are they going to bring back the senior uh, exercise classes mm -hmm. uh, here at Riverside? Yeah. And of course, that would be absolutely dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of those um, things are happening virtually, but that's not always um, something that is, again, going back to access and what um, folks feel comfortable with. And so I know um, for Aging Care Connections, they have a variety of, of classes and um, activities that are online, um, but that, again, that that is only if you're able to connect um, in that virtual world. Um, and so th those, you know, I do encourage if, if there's any ways to connect virtually in the meantime that I um, think that they're very helpful and there's a, a great deal of benefit that people do get out of it. Um, and I think that as far as what you're saying about, um, again, for the seniors and the isolation, that um, you're right, there's um, a great disappointment of that, you know, the pandemic is still happening and that, um, there is that loss of connection, especially because I think um, many times we look forward to gathering with family around the holidays or like um, even things that um, were part of um, a senior's regular routine, like going to get the hair done or going to do their groceries or things that um, all, you know, since March has been something that has been on pause and has been um, a really risky outing, right? And mm -hmm. so um, those are all losses. And so again, you know, we um, sometimes don't have enough t space or time to process and grieve those. But that, um, again, you mentioned earlier that hopefully um, with the vaccination and some other, um, if we continue to be safe, that some of those, um, there's some light at the end of the tunnel um, for, for our seniors. Um, but I do think, again, I encourage people to think about um, on new traditions for the holidays and how to connect um, with children as well as with our seniors. And so whether that's, I know for Thanksgiving, a lot of folks were doing um, Zoom calls and connecting that way um, or having children write letters to seniors or you know different ways that we can um, acknowledge that we still are connected even mm -hmm. if we can't be together mm -hmm. and just being really creative as, as we can. Let's talk about suicide uh, prevention and intervention. And Kaylin, we've discussed a number of concerns regarding mental health and suicide. If a loved one is experiencing these symptoms, what can they do? Yes, just as um, when someone might be injured or if someone might be feeling ill, there are, um, there's a, there's a, a class one can take if they're more interested on mental health first aid. We'll kind of keep it at a high level here, but 
Mental Health First Aids goes through a number of, um, of tools, resources, and getting folks much more familiar with how to have these conversations. And it's specifically for youth, um, as well as the general adult population and first responders. Um, but some, uh, one of the place it starts is really remaining attentive. So how is this individual engaging with you? Uh, what are they saying? Has their mood changed? Has their affect changed? Um, what is it that, um, is there certain elements that have shifted that are concerning? As we all know, in the era of COVID-19 and uh, the pandemic, we're spending a lot of time online. And so it may also uh, beg us to say what is not present. So if you're used to seeing someone post a lot on social media, if you're used to getting text messages, replies, calls, um, it's also important, especially right now, to notice maybe what is, what's lacking. And so all of these can be indic indicative of isolation um, or reasons for concern. And as um, Anna and all of us, I think, have mentioned tonight, the listening is so crucial. Um, offering our support, understanding, patience, and encouragement as an active and engaged listener. We don't have to be the ones that are gonna solve this or fix this, but we can offer our support. It might be that uh, we call the text line or text together. Hmm. It may be that we reach out to a trusted professional or get some support to find that trusted professional. It might be that we offer them a ride to one of NAMI Metro Suburban's living rooms in Broadview, LaGrange, and now Summit to get some support um, in a non-judgmental space as opposed to going to the ER if they are safe. I think, in, and I think I would re, uh, reiterate that affirmations and validation are very important in these conversations as well. So for someone to share with you that they are considering self-harm or suicide, it's a very brave and it's a very courageous thing to share, and it means they trust you. And as uh, we've shared, while these conversations can be difficult, the research does suggest it does not increase suicidality. It only in turn know, allows the person to know that you can be trusted and support them in their journey to getting help. Good. I'm watching the program and Caitlin, as I hear our speakers speak, I'm finding myself that some of the things I've been experiencing are in fact some of the signs and symptoms that you all talked about. What could I or what should I do to address my own mental health? Yes, so if you in this moment, if our, any of your viewers are experiencing an immediate crisis, if you are experiencing um, thoughts of self-harm or suicide and do not feel safe, we would urge you to go to the nearest emergency room or call 911. It's also very important to know that one in five Americans experiences a mental health concern in their lifetime, a mental health condition in their lifetime. You are not alone. You are in a community, you are in a family, you are in a place where you can get help. So there are so many tools, and you'll see many in the credits that follow of this conversation that will come that I know Anna will introduce us to. Um, but staying connected is really critical. Reaching out to a trusted friend can mean um, such a big difference. And they might um, help you find what you need. NAMI Metro Suburban, as I mentioned, if you are um, looking for support, offers a number of programs in our, Broadview, in our living rooms in Broadview, Summit, and LaGrange. You can call in if you don't have transportation or you don't, um, you, you, if you would rather do that virtually. And you can call in any day of the week, 365 days a year, 
between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. You can go on NAMI Met Sub for more information, as well as a number of our um, resources and um, options for referrals will be available there. Whether it be through visiting a living room, connecting with a therapist, uh, engaging in counseling, taking medication, reaching out to support, hope is possible, help is possible, and we hope you will reach out if you need it. Okay. Anita, um, my own grandfather, um, who we call Jaja, he was from the old country, from Poland, uh, he died at Cook County Hospital of cirrhosis of the liver. And we know where that came from. Um, and one of the things growing up that we would see is when he would drink, he would become very suicidal. And in fact, attempted to hang himself. What's the relationship between um, suicide or how would you intervene or prevent suicide if the alcohol and drugs is contributing to their suicidal ideation or their suicidal behavior? Well, Often, thank you, Joe. That's a really good question. Um, you know, it's uh, kind of that chicken and the egg, right? Which one comes first? Um, is it the drinking that leads me to be suicidal, or am I suicidal and that leads me to drink? Um, so a lot of times, we, we definitely want to make sure that whoever needs the help, if it's me personally or if it's my loved one, um, I'm getting the help for what I need on a number of levels. And sometimes that is multiple. Um, issues that you are looking at. Just like with medical conditions, and you might be experiencing more than one medical condition at any one given time, and you might have different specialists for those medical conditions, mm -hmm. um, you might have the same with mental health and um, substance use. We do know the majority of our professionals, just like my colleagues here, will probably be able to deal with both of those issues at the same time. So a lot of times just dialing the one number will lead you to the help that you need and will lead you to the next step. But um, definitely, especially like we've mentioned here tonight, um, with COVID, with everything that's going on in the world today, I um, you know, imagine that Jaja also went through many issues in his lifetime, um, and maybe he had things such as war and um, you know, other diseases that were going on. So as we're dealing with a super devastating kind of a worldwide effect um, on our economy, on our health, on our safety, um, it is important to look at drugs and alcohol, be those legal drugs or be those street drugs, and as well as gambling. Um, we know that everything is legal. We know that everything in moderation can be very recreational. But again, you will know when somebody is um, using more, if it's me, and I can point to, you know, I maybe I used to have a drink with dinner once a day, and now it's two or three drinks, or I'm dr drinking in, in the middle of the day because it's funny, and all my colleagues are doing it because we're all on Zoom meetings, and we're saying, oh, it's, you know, liquid lunchtime. Um, and, and those things can be really cute for memes, and those things can be very adorable for, like, you know, have Facebook post, but when it starts becoming a problem, it does start becoming a problem. Yeah. And so often, um, you might not really know the difference between am I just sad or is it really leading into suicide? And as Chris mentioned, is is that alcohol, is it the drugs, really kind of those inhibitors that are kind of you know letting me um, to do things that I might not really be doing if I was sober and mm -hmm. if I was fully in control. I was, uh, I recollect reading, and, and I did some, spent some time in New York City after the 9 11 attacks. And I remember reading SAMHSA was coming out with information how alcohol consumption in Manhattan mm -hmm. and on the West Coast significantly increased. And they were talking in terms of rates of 20%. So, you know, we're going through a national trauma, which is everywhere. And um, either the Wall Street Journal, first reporting 34% increase, or Chris, the, the statistics you had to share with us a little earlier, really brings this home in terms of a nationwide impact, a worldwide impact, I should say. We want to spend, in, uh, in, cl in closing, a few minutes talking about the Community Resource Center. Um, the Riverside Township Mental Health Board, in collaboration, with the wonderful agencies that we work with, that we support, collaboratively came together and established the Community Resource Center. And following the program and the credits, you'll see um, some slides with phone numbers, 
um, the community resource, resource centers, how to go ahead and get in contact with the CRC. Chris, can you tell, uh, talk to us a little bit about the um, uh, community resource center for Riverside Township? Absolutely. In the early 1970s, the people of Riverside Township were early to recognize that a healthy community is one where people have access to health care and human services that focus on the whole person, including their mental health and related needs. The mission of the Riverside Township Community Resource Center is to provide individuals and families with the guidance and referrals needed to live safely and successfully in the greater community. The main goal of the Resource Center is to refer individuals and families to the resource they need, whether that be for mental health conditions, substance and gambling use, suicidality, aging services, intellectual and developmental disabilities, dental services, debt counseling, food insecurity, and so forth. Basically, no matter what service you need or your family needs, we will find a way to connect you. To contact the Community Resource Center, which we will have a slide shortly after this that kind of shows so you can like see which number to call, you can call 708-853-9578 or email us at crc at riversidetownship.org. Another way to find us is to visit the Riverside Township website at riversidetownship.org for more information. Though we are currently working remotely, we are dedicated to ensuring assistance to individuals and families in need of support. Good, thank you. In closing, I would like to thank Riverside Township. I'd like to thank our supervisor uh, for supporting these uh, um, events, three of which we've had so far. Uh, Riverside Township takes mental health, substance use very seriously, and this is our attempt to reach out to the community and let them know what in fact is available. Also a note of appreciation to the Riverside Township uh, Mental Health Board and further support of this project and further especially their support of the Community Resource Center. Um, the Community Resource Center is funded by the Riverside Township uh, Mental Health Board. And in closing, uh, an appreciation to uh, Riverside Television. Um, this is Sunday evening, and uh, the crew is all here. Thank all of you for taking time out from your weekend and being part of this. And again, I'm your host, Dr. Joe Triani. Thank you for listening. And please know that help is there and available and you heard from a number of the people here who are able to provide that. Thank you for listening.